Hey, everybody. Hey. hey, welcome to another episode of Wine for Beth Street. And I am going to start right off by telling you that this is going to be a spectacular episode because we are talking the letter R, we are talking Riesling, and we have the Riesling King here with us, Stu Smith of Smith Madrone Winery. I'm telling you, if you want Riesling, if you want to know about Riesling, Smith Madrone and Stu is where you go. So welcome, Stu. Welcome. Thanks so for having me. <laughs> Looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. All right. So I, in case you don't know who I am, I am Lori, your co-host. I am owner of Dracina Wines. I write and podcast under Exploring the Wine Glass. I am a UC Davis graduate in winemaking. I am a WSET level two champagne specialist and SOM service certified. And I'm going to hand it over to Deb now. I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I am a certified specialist of wine and a wine location specialist in port and champagne. I uh, write under the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess, and I'm an author of uh, Tapping the Hudson Valley, Day Trips and Weekend Itineraries Visiting the Hudson Valley Wine Region. And big news, we're opening a restaurant in North Wildwood um, in two weeks, actually Three weeks. Yeah, two weeks, Lori. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, May 7th and 8th is our soft opening. May 14th is our grand opening. And I need my head examined. But other than that, I'm sure I probably left something out, but I'm handing it over to Stu. All right. So, Stu, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I went to UC Davis, too, as, as a graduate student. Um I did my undergraduate work at UC Berkeley, and people often ask, you know, how'd you get in the wine business? Why did you want to get in the wine business? And um, I realized as a college student uh, that I liked wine more than beer. And pretty unusual for a, for a football player, a rugby player out of UC Berkeley. And... Um, and I had a lot of friends. Uh, I met a lot of friends uh, that came from the Napa Valley, and and I'd go up and visit. And it was like I don't want to go back to L.A. area. Um, been there, done that. It was a great place to grow up, but I didn't want to go there. And and so what the heck? I I said um, as a senior at at Cal, I I, I became a what was called an inter camp inter campus exchange student. Took the introductory class out at out at. Uh, uh, Davis loved it. Applied for uh, uh, graduate school and got admitted. And Lori, um, I was Dr. Amarin's and Singleton's first teaching assistant for Vit Three. Wow! Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's my claim to fame. That's a claim. well. You've got a lot more to claim to fame than that. Well, that, <laughs> that actually that that actually is one of the my proudest achievements is is to be. Their, their very first teaching assistants okay. there. Wow. Well, and cool. I used to have, and I don't know um, when you were with, whether he was still alive or not, but I had uh, A.J. Winkler sign my general viticulture book. No. Oh, my yes. God. Yes. Oh, my God. Yeah, wow. he was still alive. He was in his, in his 90s, and wow. he lived in Texas, and he would drive up to UC. And uh, one day he was there, and I had my book, and he signed it for me. Oh my nice. God, that's got to be like a prized, prized possession, huh? Yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. That okay, is so, so awesome. Me. So that's that's how I started into the biz. Um, I uh, found a piece of property on the very top of Spring Mountain in, in the fall of 1970. And Napa Valley at that time was very, very different than today. And back then, Napa Valley was a small agricultural, uh, very provincial, backwards um, community. Uh, wine was not the dominant agricultural product by a long shot. Chickens were there. Livestock was there. Uh, wine grapes were part of it, but not, but not, the, not the big dog that it became. And... Um, uh, and 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 um, uh, uh, good friends with uh, Bob Chinchero Sutter Home, and he 
tells of when they were struggling as a as a small winery before they invented uh, white Zinfandel. When they, something would break, they'd call up Lou. The, the, the Martinis were just a, a fabulous family. And Louis would say to Bob, you know where everything is. Just rummage through your stuff, this, our stuff, until you, you find what you need. And it was a really fun uh, period of time. And it was kind of, I, I think of it as the renaissance of the wine industry. You know, uh, prohibition uh, was ended in 1933, December 5. And from 33, you know, the next 33 years, everybody was rebuilding from more or less rotten uh, rotten tanks and barrels and, and trying to learn how to make wine again. And Bob Mandavi opened the winery in 66. And, and that, that kind of started this renaissance period that I think of. And, uh, and I, I was fortunate enough to, to, to know the, the Joe Heights and the Louis Martinis and the Bob Mandavis and the Peter Mandavis and, and that group. And, and so I feel very fortunate. And Andre Chalachev in the summer of 71, I worked under Andre Chalachev, um, mapping all the vineyards that they had, he, he was pissed off uh, <laughs> that, that the family had sold off to um, uh, out of there. And, and I'd come in and I got into a big fight with him because I, I was asked to map all of the vineyards that had been sold. And there was one vineyard, uh, especially interesting. Well, there's two. Well, actually, they're all interesting. But um, on on what was called the Keg Ranch, which is now Round Pond, uh, there was in the northeast corner a, a, a thing of mixed reds. And you could obviously tell very easily that there was Zinfandel there and Carignan there and um, Grand Noir and... and um, it, but there was this other varietal, and and for some reason a bunch of suits were out that day, and um, and I said, look, these are the varietals that I know that are there, but there's this one varietal which is about twenty percent, and I think it's Blauer Portuguesa, but I've never seen Blauer Portuguesa, but I think that's what it is. And these guys looked at me and looked at one another and said, what are we doing out here? <laughs> you know, who cares? <laughs> but that endeared me to Andre. And um, and uh, and I was very friendly with him until his death, and it was it was a pleasure to be able to touch these men and certain women uh, that had made the, the industry what it was up to that time. Awesome! Um, yeah. That might be the best introduction to wine for that street we've ever had. Yes, I love it. I, I love it. Yes. So no. we're gonna play. We're gonna play our little song, and then we are going to get into Riesling. Okay. Sounds good. All right, all right. I think so here's here's another first for you. All right. Whose name is spelled when you do the alphabet like you just did? Whose name is I have no Mine. idea. Stu. 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 <laughs> it's the only name that is spelled when you do the alphabet just as you did. That is awesome. Okay. And you know what? For that, I'm raising a glass Me of too. Smith Majon Riesling. <laughs> As am I. Slancha. <laughs> so, anyhow, oh I could God. not let that pass. <laughs> that is that is fantastic. I love it. I love it. I love it. All that right. So good. All right. So Riesling. So first of all, if you can give us a little bit of history of of where Riesling comes from and how it got to, I guess, to California. Oh, to right. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
my understanding of the history of Riesling is that somehow through hook and by crook, it ended up in Germany and, and or Northern France, depending on who won what war. Um, uh, Cause all sauce went back and forth, I think nine times um, between um, the wars with Germany and France. And then uh, viticulture came to California with Harassi in the 1850s, 60s. Um, uh, real, real viticulture. Um, George Yaunt of Yauntville uh, fame uh, was the first one to plant a vineyard in Napa Valley. And I have no idea what varietals they planted. I, I suspect it was probably Mission, which is what the, um, the uh, Franciscan missionaries brought up from from um, in, into California. And Yaunt was the son-in-law of uh, Mariano Vallejo. And Vallejo gave him the, the Kaimas land grant as a way, as a, as a moving the, the frontier into the Native uh, Americans at that time. Now, from our point, why we got involved in Riesling is because my brother and I believe that Riesling is not one of the great white wine grapes of the world. It's one of the great wine grapes of the world. We're not going to singularly or, or categorize it in a separate category. We, we think, uh, we thought then, uh, my brother joined me about a year and a half after I started this, um, that Riesling is one of the great varietals of the world, period. Uh, that it's Chardonnay, Riesling, we called it Johannesburg Riesling back then. We can go through why and why we change. Um, uh, Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Cabernet. So it tastes like. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc, quite frankly, I think is an overlooked varietal because it has a very strong flavor. And when you think of Sauvignon Blanc, you can also feel that, 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 that aroma and flavor. It, it's, it's so pronounced. And uh, there are not that many other varietals that are that way. They take Merlot. Most people who are consumers don't ever taste Merlot as it is grown and made into a wine in its singularity. And one of the nice things about Merlot is that it has no Merlot character. It's in a, you know, it, it's, it, it has an ephemeral sense of, of aroma. There is no Merlot aroma. And which is why so many people use it as a blending grape to soften out the wine. And so um, where am I going on this thing? Um, Riesling. So, you know, you got to, you got to, you know, reel me back once in a while. Okay. <laughs> Keep me on like this straight and narrow. I like the tangents. Yeah. I, I, and I love tangents. The problem is remembering where I left. <laughs> <laughs> so. Riesling is was was, and when I started in in, in getting in, interested in wine in the mid sixties, um, Riesling was almost as popular as any other grape. Um, uh, Chablis, white Burgundies, Clarets, Bordeaux, um, Burgundies, red Burgundies, they were all kind of kissing cousins with one another. I remember buying a Romani Conti for $10 and it wasn't particularly very good. Um, and, and, and it was a whole way different wine world. And when I was at Berkeley as a, as a senior, there was a wonderful wine shop uh, called Jackson's party service on the North, uh, pardon me, the Southeast corner of, of Berkeley going into Claremont. And they had a bottle of 61, Lafitte. And I was working at a wine shop in um, Rinda, and I knew about all the different wine shops and what they had. And they had a bottle of 61 Lafitte. And I'd go in there, and if you guys ever saw the movie Dr. Strangelove, where Dr. Strangelove reaches out his hand to buy it, and then he brings it in, and he beats his hand down. That's how I was with that bottle. It was $27. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> $27 for a bottle of 2000, uh, uh, 1961. And 
Um, I just couldn't that do it. That was a lot of money back then. That was a huge amount of money. Um, uh, Beaulieu was selling their regular at two Cabernet at 275 and the reserve it was like at 375. And I took my big brother to a store on the Solano Avenue. I've forgotten the name of the store. It was on the north side of the deal. And I bought a case. The first case of wine I ever bought was a case of 66 Pichon Baron. And I wrote this check. It was so extravagant. Right. Yeah, I, was, shaking. I was shaking <laughs> to do this. It was $43 in change for the entire case. And so to pay $27 for one bottle was just insane. And, and I, I, I couldn't do it. I, I never could do it. I never did get it. Um, but I had the whole case of the 66 Pichon Baron. So I think it was it was it was not a bad trade off. But anyway, yeah, not a bad trade -off. Riesling, <laughs> back to R. Riesling, we love Riesling. Um, our first wine that we made commercially, legally, um, wasn't the first wine we made, but it was the first wine that that we had. My brother and I built the winery and started in '73, and uh, money was always an issue, so it didn't get built real quick because we were the ones who built it. And, um, and, and, and our first real legal crush was 77. And, and we did the um, Riesling, just, just 269 cases of Riesling. Because so when we you, bought this. What made you plant Riesling? Well, because we were good, arrogant American boys. I've come up with all these sayings. Uh, and I, I love sayings that I've learned. By, by doing, by by living. And one of them is uh, California makes every bit as bad a Pinot Noir as do the French. They got nothing on us there. <laughs> um, and that's especially true since I don't make it now. But with Riesling, um, there's an elegance to Riesling. There's a sophistication to Riesling. There's a thing with Riesling that I think no other varietal has. and And that is that um, you bring the grapes in directly from the vineyard. It goes right through the, the crusher, the must pump, the press into the tank. You settle it, you ferment it, you clarify it, you bottle it, out it goes. And, and we do a little bit of magic in between. But fundamentally, there's no malolactic fermentation. There's no French American oak. You don't have to worry about what your toast level is because there's no barrels. There's no lees, botanage, stirring, any of that. You really get the pure expression of the grape. We started out at a residual sugar of about 1.7 uh, in the beginning. Um, and that first vintage, which was 79, unbeknownst to us, ended up winning what was called the Wine Olympics held in Paris in 1979. And it was um, sponsored by the wine and food magazine, Go Mio. And it was technically the very first international wine tasting with international judges. Now, we all know about the, the judgment in Paris, but that was a very small little group, all done by French folks, handled by uh, who just passed. And, um, and, it had, it, and, it, and it got all the attention. This tasting got a certain amount of attention but not nearly that which the judge in Paris did because they were all French judges. Um, so that was a tangent that I went in, out to. And so I got to reel myself back. I'm going to reel, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reel, I'm gonna reel you back at 1.7 RS. What was the acidity at that point to. <sighs> we were. I mean, I, Right. What were, you know what I'm saying? I don't need to be specific. Well, yeah. No, that's right. One of the consistencies with Riesling is that we've always thought, and, and back then and still to this day, that about 22, 22.5 degrees bricks is the, is, the, is the level that we want. Because we end up with um, enough natural acidity. If you get much higher than that, you're going to start getting higher alcohols. And one of the things, Lori, that I've found, and, and maybe you've seen, well, uh, and, and that is that when I got out of Davis 
we all thought the conversion rate of bricks to sh to alcohol you know where you're was going. Supposed be, right was supposed to be 0.55 bs we're looking at we're looking at conversion factors of close to to 0 0.625 mm -hmm. and one of the things that i have been been barking at the moon over for 40 years now is that we need yeasts that are less efficient in converting sugar to alcohol it's okay to have slightly higher sugars if that's what you want but that high conversion rate just doesn't work you get the, the, the alcohol is too high and 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 the um uh uh, I'm, I'm trying not to wing off into left field here. Uh, I'm trying, you know, discipline. Um, we need to have yeast, the manufacturers of yeast, come up with less efficient um, yeast. And, less super um, yeast. Right. So as an example, if you had 24 degrees bricks, and for everyone that's listening, um, pardon me, uh, that would give you a alcohol if you harvested at 24 degrees bricks at 0.55 would give you 13.2 percent alcohol if you harvested it at um 24 degrees bricks and multiplied by 0.625 which is the real conversion rate you're at 15. That's so it's a high. huge huge spread yeah huge spread and uh, back to Pinot Noir, I know we're on R, but there's a P in the world. And, and um, when we started making Pinot Noir, my brother and I said, look, there's no one in California that we can mimic to, to, to look at and say, okay, they're doing it right. Because frankly, uh, Pinot Noir is enormously difficult to make, uh, to make a good one. Anybody can make a Pinot Noir, but to make a good one is really special. And and so we said, since there's no one in California that we can follow, let's have an attitude that is very cavalier. Who gives a shit? What does it matter? It's just Pinot Noir. And maybe that way we will stumble onto the way to do it. And one of those things that we did is that we started, and, and this we started in 75, um, we started making Pinot Noir with what, what I called a Bronco fermentation. We used wild yeast. And since we were in the West and it's wild, I called it a Bronco fermentation. And did you trademark that? I did not. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, 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 was, that was not the attitude back then. T today, that's mm -hmm. the attitude. Mm -hmm. So so what happened is, and it and it and it worked like clockwork, and that is Klekra, which is a wild yeast took off at about three and a half days on the dot. And for everyone listening, that's both good and bad because Klekera kicks off ethyl acetate, which is nail polish remover. And so you, the first time this happened, I went, oh God, we screwed the pooch on this one. And by the ah, I'll, I'll go to my book and I'm going, ah, Klekera kicks off ethyl acetate, but dies off at about one and a half percent alcohol. And then the dominant yeast in the winery takes off, which is Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and whoosh, the thing finishes. So unbeknownst to us, we were the first winery, well, we, we knew we were the first winery to go back to, um, to go to wild yeast. And we didn't know because nobody thought it was of any importance. And that is that we did a pre-fermentation maceration, a cold soak, if you would. <laughs> Now, the issue about cold soaks is that there's no alcohol, so there's no real extraction. And so what I learned, and uh, which will, you'll have to get me off P and on back on to R, is that um, w one day I was on top of the tank with my flashlight looking down into the tank, and the whole front of the flashlight fell out. So two big D cell batteries <laughs> plopped into the deal now the tank wasn't very full and at that time we weren't using carbon dioxide to purge the tank of oxygen so my i stripped down to my skivvies my brother put a rope around me and lowered me into the tank because 
What are you going to do? You're not going to leave those damn batteries in there. <laughs> I mean, really. So I'm about waist deep into in must, and I'm feeling around the tank with my feet trying to find the damn two batteries, and I found them. It took about 20 minutes. <laughs> but it also taught me that the must isn't all that uniform in there. There are places where there's lots of grapes in one place, not a lot of stems in another. It was really kind of interesting to know that the 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 must was not uniform in its distribution. Interesting. Uh, now that vintage was the 1980 vintage, which was as good a Pinot Noir as my brother and I have ever tasted in Cal from California. That's because it had battery in it. Exactly. And but they you. were only there, and they you. were only there for 20, 25 <laughs> minutes. They hadn't been great. That's fantastic. Yet. That's fantastic. Um, so Go, really you back to to Riesling. Yeah. I I think one of the coolest things about Riesling and what makes it so special uh and I'm going to throw in I I think Chenin Blanc falls into this category also is that Riesling can be made anywhere across the spectrum of that that sweetness level and there's quality wines there. So what is it about Riesling that allows you to make a dry Riesling, a semi-sweet, you know, a semi-dry, a semi-sweet right, or right. a sweet Riesling? Well, for, first of all, we started out at 1.7 and percent residual sugar, and we called it off dry. And I hated the term off dry. Who wants to call their wine off? I mean, that's just, <laughs> You're that's, right. just that's just awful. Right. And and we we dried it down and dried it down and we we've gone as low as 0.43, and we figured okay. and, and we realized that was a little too too low and we're generally bouncing around in the 0.65 to 0.75, and and one of the things about Riesling is that there is no nomenclature legal or otherwise that tells you what style or 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 how dry the wine is um when i was younger and a little bit more kind of uh wild haired i thought maybe we should put on the side of the side of the label um number of candy bars three candy bars uh -huh. to where people could taste it but that it was a hard sell outside the tasting room because people had this perception that it was sweet. So, and, and so I was saying, uh, you know, so it, it sells for you. Well, yeah. And I said, um, and, and what level of sugar is it that sells best for you? Oh, we, we, we do a dry Riesling and I'm going, wow, that's strange. Um, and finally it clicked into my head and I said, well, by the way, how dry is your, Dry Riesling. He goes two percent because there was no legal definition. Definition, and 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 that's one of the problems with Riesling all along is that we the consumer doesn't know what they've been doing. I have been threatening for decades to put back to the label dry here, and and my view is that anything under one percent, pretty much like champagne. Uh, is dry. <clears throat> but how about the um, national international uh, Riesling Foundation? Their scale, the little, putting the little scale on the on the back. Doesn't work for me. No. Yeah. That just it just it, it it my 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 candy bar scale I thought was better. <laughs> I like the candy bar idea. I like Even I knew that too. wasn't going to work. I um, like the candy bar. Uh. <laughs> You know, the other thing that we did with Riesling uh, uh, is in 1983, I was teaching over at Santa Rosa Junior College in the evening uh, in viticulture and enology, the ba basic, basic viticulture and enology class. And, um, and I used to say that California needed to stand on its own two feet. We should not be using European place names. And when I got into the business back in the late 60s, um, Chianti and Burgundy and Rhine wine and, and Sauterne. These were all terms. I even want to say, but I won't be very strong in this belief 
because nobody else remembers it. But at Wente, Wente Brothers had a Chateau Ecam wine, and it was a sweet dessert wine. And I've heard that. Have you? Yeah. So yeah. it's not a place memory. I really did remember that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is this tonight is worth all of that just for that that confirmation. Um, and then I would bring out our Riesling, and and it said Johannesburg Riesling, and I'm going, that doesn't work. So the next morning I was at work with my brother, and I said to Charlie, I said, Charlie, what do you think about shit canning Johannesburg and calling it just Riesling? He goes, yeah, that works for me. Go ahead. So that started a six-month battle with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And this was like 83. And we didn't have faxes. We didn't have email. You had to either phone or write a long letter. So I had this long-running battle with them saying, I want to call it Riesling. And they wrote back saying, sorry, but Riesling is not an approved name. And if you don't like Johannesburg Riesling, you can call it White Riesling. That's the other approved name. And I used their name. And finally, after six months of me badgering them, they got me on the phone and said, we've approved your label. It's just Riesling. Nobody cares. Leave us alone. I was going to say, they were like, leave us alone. You win. You win. That's right. And it is the only time I have ever won against my government and probably the only time I ever will. Now, St. Michelle, uh, bless their heart, um, asked for an eight-year use-up, and the BATF gave it to them because they it's said it's going to take us. It's going to take eight years for them to transition their people from Johannesburg Riesling to either Riesling or White Riesling. Wow. Because, because about four years after that, the BATF did 180 degrees and outlawed Johannesburg Riesling, but still allowed White Riesling. And they gave anybody who, besides... In, in, um, St. Michelle petitioned them and got it, but anybody could have used it, I think, an eight-year use-up. In other words, in eight years, they got they got to call it Johannesburg Riesling for the next eight years. And my brother and I made that decision in like a nanosecond uh, to, to get rid of it. Now, white Riesling is still redundant. They still shouldn't allow it. Uh, but that's one of the things that I'm very proud, my brother and I are very proud about, is that we were the ones responsible for bringing in Riesling as the true the true name of the varietal, and for shit canning, pardon my French, um, Johannesburg Riesling. And so for about 15 years, we were the only one doing this, and we were the only one who could have, although we didn't, um, export wine to Germany because it was it would have been approved by them because it was Riesling. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. That's your, I mean, you got lots of claims to fame, but that's a huge claim to fame. You know, it's one of the ones I'm, I'm very proud of. Um, it, 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 it doesn't bias anything, <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is, um, it is, yeah. you know, and I, I think it shows our love for the varietal. We just yeah. love the varietal. You know, the other thing as we're talking about it is that there's no other varietal white wine that ages as well. Nor, and then we'll go back to it, but nor is there any other varietal that 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 um, is accompanies food in a way that Riesling does. Uh, you know, as I like to say somewhat flippantly, no wine goes with uh, Brussels sprouts or asparagus. But after that, um, there's no wine that is more versatile, that can go with more things than does Riesling. And when you age Riesling, you age, uh, 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 and not every vintage, I have to be, you know, honest about this. Not every vintage is going to last 25, 30 years. But when they are good, they are every red wine. Um, and we're, with our Riesling, you get a bottle which is really close to greatness. Yes. And the 16 is just. So, so I'm going to, I'm just going to take. I'm just going to want to take that time to say to segment. So to prove 
that that Smith Madrone's uh, Rieslings are age worthy. They currently are selling a uh, vertical um, of seven, seven, six years, six years. Seven doesn't make sense in packaging. (laughs) 14, 15, 16, 17. Yes. Right. For 250 bucks, which we think is a great deal. And so you can go back and see how the vintages are. And that also um, exemplifies what it is that we believe in in winemaking, which is that vintage dating is a celebration of the diversity of the vintages. And that's what wine is all about. It's not pounding the square peg through the round hole. Not on our not on our side of the wine business. If if we're set at home and making gazillion cases of white Zinfandel, absolutely go for it. But what we're trying to do is to get the vintage into the glass of wine. Whatever Mother Nature put or didn't put into that wine, it's our job as the grower and the winemaker to extract that and to get that uniqueness into the into that glass. And from you know, in, in that same concept, we we know the, the 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 term terroir. And we can argue about what it means forever and ever until the cows come home. And in the new world, we talk about it as being somewhat of a sense of place. I think of it as an ephemeral sense of art. That Smith Madrone Chardonnay should be different from Keenan Chardonnay or Schwager Chardonnay or Stony Hill Chardonnay, all our neighbors, or Robert Mondavi or Kendall Jackson. Each winery should make something that is unique into themselves because of the site where the grapes are grown, the varietal, um, the, the climate, the grower's attitude toward things, the winemaking attitude toward things. And all of that together is, is what I think should become unique. And if it's not unique, let's say our wines are no different than, than Robert Mondavi or Kendall Jackson, we don't we don't deserve to exist because they can make it cheaper than we can. We believe that we can make something that they can't. And so that's our reason, you know, to exist is to make something which is unique and different. And we make wines for ourselves. My my son, Sam, and my brother and Charlie and myself, we make wines for us. We and, and if we like if we like the wines then we think there are enough people out there that that have a similar palate to us and we stay in business. And if we get so whacked out that nobody else likes the kind of wines we like, then we don't have a reason to exist. So let's talk about what's in our glass. Yes. Shall we? So Lori and I have the 16. Yes. And you have the 17, correct? I have both the 16 and the 17. Both. Yes. It's a petrol in it. I love the 16. The 16 vintage was a terrific vintage. So um, it was warm, wasn't it? I don't even know it anymore. No. I, the, the fires have, have fried my brain. Oh. Um, and uh, it, it, between the fires and the pandemic, um, I don't remember yeah. squat anymore. Uh, what I know is that the 16 Chardonnay, the 16 Cabernet, and the 16 Riesling and the 16, we do a Cook's Flat Reserve. They're all just fabulous wines. And kind of like my children, I don't take credit and I don't take blame. And and if you want to blame somebody or credit somebody, it's Mother Nature. It's it's um it's it's her doing that allows us to make wine from really special grapes. And we do the same thing in growing grapes pretty much every year. And um, and and that stamp, that uniqueness, that diversity, is you know I I think vintage dating is is to celebrate that diversity, as I said earlier. It's so important for a small winery not to make it all the same. There should be differences between vintages. The seventeen I had just before I came here is is a, a little bit more austere uh, at this same stage. This wine is just beautiful and and a lovely um just elegant uh, aroma of of floral and and flowers and and um 
I mean, it's like sticking your nose into a bouquet of flowers. I, I'd go with that. I'm I'm loving it. It's just there's it, there's an elegance with it, and it just dances. And it's also hedonistic. It just it it thrills the senses. Mm -hmm. And also another one is that you you taste the the taste is confirm is confirming the aroma. And yes. I, I and and for me that's that's a little thing that I really like in a wine. Not all wines get that. Not even all of our wines get that. But when that aroma and that taste are coordinated together, that is the balance that I'm really looking for. And I I and it's I've wonderfully got, balanced. Yes. I mean um and, and that's what Rieslings are all about, is that balance between sugar and acidity. Mm -hmm. And, and the interesting flavors and layers that go with it. And and uh, uh, the six, our 16 Chardonnay, which unfortunately is sold out. And our 16. I'm just Riesling. saying, I have four bottles, baby. I have four. Oh, I love that wine. I just think that is a fabulous wine. Um, I have four. And, uh, uh, so, Stu, I, Stuart, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, on on your Riesling, and it's planted on your Eastern exposure. Is there a reason for that? Yes. Um, when I was laying out things, by the way, um, uh, we do have magnums of the sixteen Riesling still available. Ooh. And they're very fun bottles. Of he needs the least amount of heat, uh, and is susceptible to frost, as is Chardonnay. And then Riesling really fell in somewhere in between. The Chardonnay and Pinot Noir push the earliest, the Cabernet pushes the latest, and the Riesling comes out between the two of them. And so on, on, on this area that's called Cook's Flat, there's just a little bit of a dip in it. And we put the Cabernet there. We, we originally planted five acres in 1972, five acres of Cabernet and Pinot Noir, Chardonnay and Riesling. And so I put the Cabernet in this one area because of the little dip, thinking that if there was frost, that would be the right place to put Cabernet because it pushes later, so, so almost two weeks later than Chardonnay. So you don't want to put Chardonnay in a place that might catch frost. So then I put the Pinot Noir on the north slope. Um, uh, we put the Chardonnay um, out on the end of Cook's Flat. And um, and then on a south-facing slope, and then we put the Riesling on kind of an east-facing slope. So life and life on the mountain is a compromise. You don't get to do whatever it is. This the 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 layout of the land, the the site is the overarching um, issue there, and and you can't change that. And so you have to learn to work with it. And that's how I came to that decision of putting the Riesling where it is. And I think all things being equal, it worked out pretty well. Um, one of the things I learned is that, and we laid out everything on, on uh, the contour because soil erosion was a very important thing back then. Uh, I mean, we were growing grapes in the mountains and our average rainfall is about 50 to 55 inches per year. We've had over a hundred inches and we've had less than 12 inches uh, back in 76, 77, 78, which is where we are now. And it's another fingernails on, on the chalkboard because of the drought, which we don't need after all of the fires and all the other stuff that's been going on. But that's, you know, that's life. Um, and, um, and that seems to have worked out okay. Uh, uh, the Riesling has, and, and the Riesling is a reasonably, reasonably easy grape to grow. But in doing all of this, in growing the grapes and making the wine, you have to decide way early, and you have to embrace it into your brain. You have to, you have to have your brain um, conditioned that you're there to make good wine. You're not there to make quantity. And my brother and I early on, very early on, yeah. said we would rather make, let's just say, 500 cases of really good wine 
rather than a thousand cases of mediocre yeah, one. Absolutely. You do what is in the best interest of, of the varietal. If, if you have a large, if, if the grapes set a large crop and you think it's too much, you don't think about, well, what's my accountant going to say? He says, well, screw the account. You're looking at wine quality. So you don't even right. have to make that judgment. You've, you've, you've predetermined what your, 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 your um, management is going to be. And you just know that you always make a decision for the best quality. And so you drop the fruit or you don't make the wine. So 17, uh, we had, we had uh, 17 was the, you know, the, the, the fire and a really hot Labor Day. And we lost all of our red grapes to that, to that Labor Day weekend. And, um, and so it was never a question of, are we going to bottle the wine? Because the, the wine just wasn't good enough. And what happened is it shriveled and we couldn't stop it from shriveling. So we went out, we dropped fruit. Okay. Well, but, but it just kept shriveling. And the interesting thing is that the vines look good. We still don't quite understand it. And one of the things that I think as an industry we're dealing with is, is we really don't have enough research going into rootstocks and especially rootstocks that are drought tolerant. We use um, uh, mostly uh, Vitus um, uh, repestris versus versus uh, Vitus riparia. And for those listening, Vitus riparia is, as you might expect, riparia being those those vines in this in the um, uh, desert southwest grow along a riparian corridor. So their feet go down into a a a wet water area. Vitus repestris is in the middle of the goddamn desert where there's no water and no nothing. So there's really fine rootlets, and those roots are able to lift water up from a great depth and bring it over into the vine. So we use 1103 Paulson. We started out with 110R, which I didn't like. Um, and now we're, you know, we, found, we planted our first uh, complete block with 140 Ruggieri. And we like that. And we're going to, um, the, the next block that we do, we're going to go back to St. George because we're looking at what we used to do every, originally the vines were planted on their own roots in 1972. And we had an acre of AXR. And after that first year, my brother and I made our own rootstocks, our own bench grafts. We made a little, we made a little greenhouse and uh, we calloused them up and we did all this stuff, all our stuff. And we still have a block. And it will always be called the bench graft block because that whole vineyard was the first vineyard that we made our own rootstocks, our own bench grafts. Then we grew them in in the um, in the soil down, which we, we now call the nursery cabernet, because it had no rocks, and that's where we grew them for a year. Then we dug them up and planted them in the anyway. We did all kinds of wild and crazy things back then. This is too, um, Michael has a question for you. Here. Yeah, he said. Um, your Riesling is so wonderfully different. What percentage is attributed to your vineyard elevation versus being dry farmed? Oh, I think um, I wouldn't say it's either or. I think it's both. Uh, we do try to give them water a little bit if we have any for plastic pots that, that um, tomatoes come in because these were on their own roots and we were an increased block. We were increased block number 91. We were the first growers in Napa Valley who had heat treated certified rootstock and everything that came off of our vineyard, we were able to sell because money was really important. And, um, uh, but, and, then, and then I said, well, if we could get 15 years out of it. And, and the reason we didn't graft them is because there was no graftable rootstock that was heat treated certified. So we had the, we planted the one acre of AXR and we made our own rootstocks and then started doing that. And eventually uh, dealing with that, we didn't need to do. Um, where was I going on this? Um, so rootstock or, or um, uh, the question was dry farming and, and, and elevation. I don't know that either is exclusive to the other. Um, Clearly, you can overwater down in the valley floor. I'm not sure that anyone's got enough water to overwater in the mountains. Um, 
In 17, we had to reevaluate climate because we lost the sh the Cabernet, all the reds, uh, because we had a um, a really, really substantially hot dry spell um, and and single digit um, humidity and wind, and all of those things are climate change uh, direction. And so, after that, we started trying to give the vines a little bit of water. Now we start the vines out with water. There's no question. We irrigate when we when we plant a vineyard up to about five, six, seven years. And it's a little bit like tough love for kids. Uh, at somewhere six, seven years, we, 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 we kick them out. But then what I realized is that sometimes these kids need to come home and have a little TLC. And that's what we learned with the 17 vintage, that um, maybe, maybe these grapes needed just a little bit of water. Um, and so that's what we've tried to do for the last couple of years is give them a, a, a little bit of a drink, not enough to stimulate growth, but just to keep them from desiccating, to, from, from getting too stressed out with the heat that we're now looking at. Um, and then also, um, in this mix, uh, uh, with that question is that we have um, uh, the vineyard is all non-till. So it's not as though we cultivate the vineyard. And so the cover crop takes a certain amount of, of, um, of moisture. And then on top of that, by not cultivating, we can't get any capillary action by cultivating and bringing moisture up from the bottom, from low on. That's the theory, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But the idea is if you cultivate, you bring the soil up, you, you turn the soil, is drying out, the soil is drying out. Um, we also have at the same time a tremendous, uh, it's a business issue, uh, but it's affecting anyone who lives or, or operates in the hills. And that is all the insurance people have bailed. Yes. And, and so a friend of mine, uh, who's not really all that different from us in size, got a renewal of $150,000 for his insurance. And he went, uh, I can't afford that. And probably is, I don't know whether he's gone naked or not. Um, I can tell you that our insurance, and, and I, I, don't, I don't care, uh, our insurance was $12,700 a year. That's a, wow. Oh, no, wait. And that's just one, that's what, just your. That was, that was before. And that's just your property? That's uh, general liability. General liability. Auto. Uh, um, uh, umbrella and property. It went up. We we expired on this one night, and at two thirty that afternoon, I got the one and only bid of fifty four thousand dollars. It went from twelve seven to fifty four. That's to crazy. Night. It's worse now. That is and crazy. It, yeah. Right. And that's if that's if you can get it because a lot yeah. of the a lot of them want nothing to do with it. So they're forcing wineries to be naked. Right. Yes. There. Right. Right. And and uh, I have to be very blunt. It's keeping me up at night. It's scaring the shit out of me. Um uh this has just been a brutal year. And the insurance issue, our insurance uh renews in August. We understand that California, you know, we ended up on what would be called, um, I don't know if you guys have it. You know, if you're a bad driver, you end up in a thing called assigned risk yeah. in California. Okay. okay. Well, we ended up in the equivalent assigned risk called California Fair Plan. Um, and you, it's the court of the last resort. And it's really shitty insurance, but it saved us a, a certain amount of money. It, it made it affordable to have us because we, we don't want to go bare. Now I'm not afraid of losing the fire, the the winery or, or the shop or anything, to the forest fire. I'm just worried about the incidental fire, the plug that went bad, the rat or the mouse that chewed into the damn electrical wire. I mean, we live in the we live in a rural area. These are real critters that we have to deal with, and um, and and that's that that that's driving all of us just batshit, and um. And it's really hard. But not only that, that hefty price is just going to reflect in the price to the consumers. 
Well, that that's that's the economic well. theory, but 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 that doesn't that doesn't always work, you know, in economic theory. And, and my undergraduate degree at Berkeley is in econ, happened to be macroeconomics, but nonetheless, it's still econ. And that is that you don't get to pass on things to the consumer. Not everything. You can pass, nope. you can pass them on if if they're willing to buy, accept the price, and you can still sell. But in a highly competitive industry like the wine yeah. industry, you 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 can't yeah. necessarily think you can do that. You can't pass it on. No, you can't. And, uh, make it cost consumers, prohibitive. right? Consumers are going to raise a flag from if you're selling a twenty dollar bottle of wine, and now because your insurance goes up, you're going to forty dollars. Exactly. You're not going to sell that wine. Exactly. They, they don't care, nor should they. That's not their right. issue. They just want to drink. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. And 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 frankly, the pandemic was was uh, you know I thought going into the pandemic we were just going to get slayed, and the pandemic was actually pretty good. Um, it, it really does prove the fact that God loves us and wants us to be happy, which is why He created wine. There you yes. go. There you go. So, Stu, I have a I have a kind of a technical uh, Riesling question. So, you talked about where when it harvests and stuff, but what is there anything that Riesling is prone to? You know, like is it prone to mildew? Is it prone to you know measles? Measles. What did you say? Measles. Really? Okay, you're yeah. killing me on that. No, no, it's a, it's a it's a it's a grapevine disease. Um, it generally happens when the vines are old. Berries then come up with a kind of a dark gray color and they have spots on them. Now, okay. it, it doesn't hurt the fruit. You don't have to cut the fruit out. It just looks like hell. Oh, okay. And, and the vine will show measles one year and not the next year. But that happens when they get older and, and sooner or later, they're going to start to, to decline. But it's measles, and Chardonnay has um, uh, Phomopsis, and right. Cabernet Sauvignon uh, has um, uh, Utypa dead arm. So each varietal is is got its own little peculiar issues that we have to look after. Um, and when it has its measles, is it affecting the ability to ripen correctly? To, or is not as far as I know. Okay. Uh-uh. Not as far as I know. I don't think it it affects the the the, the uh, and, and there aren't many. You know, it's it's not as though there's ten percent or, or even five percent. There's probably less than one percent that just pops up as the Riesling vineyard gets older. And it's basically a way of saying, "Hey, I'm getting old, and and um, think about replanting us in the next four or five, six, seven years." Um, uh, and uh, you know, one of the one of the wonderful, interesting things about being in the wine business is that you don't know everything, and and um, you only get to replant so many times in your life, and and we're, you know, we started replanting because of phylloxera in '98. Um, some of our vineyards are coming into maturity, real maturity. You know, there was 20, 22, 25 years old. 20, 22 years old. They were older, um, uh, but you know, we, we, when you, as a grower, when your vines start to decline, uh, in our case, it was because of phylloxera in the late nineties. Um, it's a, it's a shock. It's, it's very hard to look at something that you've spent 20, 25 years on. So we it's planted in right? 72, we started replanting in 98. So that's what, 30 years. So after 30 years, you start replanting a vineyard and you're going, God, that hurts. Um, and and it's it's depressing. I mean, it's 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 physiological. It's, it, it hurts. Um, these are your babies. These are your children. Um, but then the, the silver lining comes through and you, you get kind of perked up and, and, and build up and you're going, it gives me an opportunity to put into use that which I have learned over the last 30 plus years. So is the road direction going in the right direction? And in our case, sometimes it wasn't. Is it the right row spacing? Is it the right rootstock? You know, what's the trellis system? 
And so we originally laid out the vineyard entirely over soil erosion. But in the late 70s, we went to non-till. And then uh, in the mid 80s, or late 80s, early 90s, um, we went to a wheel tractor to farm our property. And if you had said to me in 1971 that we could have a wheel tractor farm our slopes, I would have said you were just flat out nuts. <laughs> and and we have a and and when I first started into this, <clears throat> the uh, the John Deere dealer said, "Let me send you up a a, a narrow gauge." tractor. And I said, a narrow gauge, I, Bob, you're out of your ever loving brain. So he sent up a standard tractor and I'm looking at this thing. And I'm going, okay, Bob, you were right. Send up the narrow gauge because what they can do is spew the wheels way out. And the narrow gauge was lower to the ground and we can go anywhere with this thing. Now we, it, 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 it isn't as sturdy on the, on the ground, nor can it pull the gondolas of our grapes that our that our crawler does, because our crawler you know weighs close to 10,000 10, pounds, and this damn wheel tractor probably only weighs, even with all the weights on it, three thousand maybe I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, but it gave it gives us a lot of flexibility. But anyway, the idea is that that then we 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 could lay out the vineyards because of non-till, and we chop like like a lawn. Um, you just chop the lawn until the, the, the water ends, you know, the, the season ends of the rainfall and the grass dries out and then you move on. And so um, uh, where was it going on this? Um, so, so you have dry farming and uh, just lost. Go wheel me back in. Um, okay, so I'm going to wheel you back in, but I'm going to ch completely change the topic. Sure. And let's talk about food and Riesling. Cool. What I are like your that. favorite food pairing, pairings with Riesling? I have almost no favorites, but there are none that I don't want to do with the exception, as I mentioned earlier, which is... Um, asparagus. Uh, well, no, no, not even asparagus. It's goofballs. It's Brussels sprouts and artichokes. Um, depending on asparagus, asparagus can actually work. I don't think there's anything that, that it doesn't go with. It especially goes with any of the white meats, chicken, you know, um, silver palate cookbook, you know, perfect. Yep. Uh, uh, onion soup, uh, pumpkin soup, marriage made in heaven, uh, any of the fusion, uh, Mexican food. Chinese food with Riesling. Yeah, yeah, with absolutely. Right. Yeah. We've, um, done, we've done yours with Asian. Mexican and it's, it's nice. It's it's okay. It's not the best, but it's it's better than Chardonnay. It's better than any other varietal uh, because uh, Riesling has such a powerful powerful aroma and flavor. Uh, and so I, you know, th that's the other thing. And and what I learned about with with food pairing was again my subconscious mind. I, I would be sitting at the table and I and I I started pushing a little bit of food off to the side to eat at the last thing because it went with the wine in a way that the other food didn't. So I ate that portion of the dinner first and then finished up the dinner with that which was the most compatible with the wine. And, and I realized that I was doing this subconsciously <laughs> because the brain, you know, it's, 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 it gets back to this concept I have, which is the brain cheats. Um, it's trying to tell you what you don't want to listen to. So it just takes over right. and, and starts making you do things, um, that, that, you know, are there, but, but you, you don't think would really work, but, but, but the subconscious is there. And so that works. And so, um, uh, there's no question that only champagne can do better than Riesling in the morning. All right. I agree. The the, um, the other one is that I don't think re any other varietal has a story that goes with Riesling that that this story does, and that is um, Charlemagne uh, in the 14th century was uh, wounded in battle in in Germany, 
Uh, he had a long, lingering, slow death, and his generals got bored waiting around one for either Charlemagne to die or to get better. So they went out wine tasting. And they came back in the late afternoon, just schnocker. But you know, you you know, they, they burst they burst into Charlemagne's room and they said, Buddy, you gotta drink with us. We found this great wine. And and uh and Charlemagne says, just get out, leave me alone, just let me die in peace. And drunk generals, I suspect are drunk generals of the world over. They don't take no for an answer. So finally, Charlemagne had to relent and said, okay, give me a glass of wine. So he started drinking with them. They all went and passed out. And the next morning, Charlemagne started to get better. And he recovered. And the wine has been called Burncastler Doctor ever since. <laughs> now, it may well be an apocryphal story. But it is still a fun story. It's a fun story. It definitely oh, is. Funny. It definitely is. And Michael has Michael's favorite is with uh, spicy uh, fish dishes. Chinese. Chinese. Oh yeah. 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 Spicy Chinese. Yeah. I I don't know anything that it doesn't go well with again yeah. except for Brussels sprouts and artichokes. But then nothing goes with Brussels sprouts and artichokes. Um, no, I love Riesling. I probably of of the three of us at the winery. I drink more Riesling than the two of them combined. Um, to me, it is a truly great wine. Um, and it's just so hedonistic and so flavorful and so interesting. Uh, and it's so just, elegant. You, you and so elegant. The elegance, yeah. the elegance yeah. of this wine is just incredible. And I have, you know, I have spent my entire life like Sisyphus rolling that damn rock up the hill. And just when I think it's going to get over the edge, it rolls back down on me. And as frustrating as that is from a sales point of view, we won't give it up because we know how good it is. And and I'm hoping that just like wing, ticks, wing, wing tip shoes come into fashion every 40 or so years, Riesling will eventually come back into fashion. Well, I think I think you are leading the path. I think Smith Madrone is leading the the path in that because there are so many people who say that their favorite Riesling is Smith Madrone, and you know, uh, I I mean, I to be honest, I don't I like Riesling, but I don't buy a lot of it. But I buy yours every vintage. You know? One of the things we found is that a lot of young people and and the sommelier community love Riesling. Um, why you all and they can't transform this into a, you know, the, the, the next thing, I don't know, but, but we, we all have the great knowledge of knowing we love what we know and um, we'll see. Yeah. But so I want to thank you for joining us today and sharing your, your knowledge and your stories and just honestly, Stu, being you, because I love you. I love you. It's yeah, and I, I'm honored to finally meet you after tasting your wines and falling in love with your wines and falling in love with you. So thank you. And I can't wait to be able to come out and, and visit you in person. Well, we, we're looking forward to that. We're trying to figure out when we're going to reopen. Uh, we, we don't know quite yet. Um, I think the rush to reopen is um, somewhat sophomoric, maybe uh, whatever the term would be called. We're, 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 we're a little reluctant to open until we can treat people the way they should be. We think they should be treated. Mm -hmm. And if I never read another protocol about how to deal with something because of the pandemic, it will be way too soon. Oh, I, I hear you. I concur. I concur. Yeah, yes. I hear you. So we, we, we want to be, able, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. You you go. Well, I just want to say that we want to be able to greet people in, in a very natural way and 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 um, and be hospitable. And and uh, as long as there are all these restrictions, that right. just doesn't seem the way to do it. Yeah, it's it's very it's a very awkward situation. Like, all right, so I'll shake your hand. No, I'm not going to shake your hand. Oh, I'm going to do you know, it's it's it, it will be nice when it's just back to being a human being to another human being interacting going like this. Yes, yes, yes. You know? yes. yeah, yes. exactly. And and one of the things about the wine, 
Um, and that is that I think wine is the, one of the greatest beverages ever created on, on earth. And it really belongs, it, it's, a, it's a social beverage. It's not a beverage that you want to drink by yourself. I mean, liquor's quicker. Um, <laughs> I mean, in fact, but that's not what wine's for. Wine's there to, to, to Share. go for it. Battle another but, day. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so you are not open for tastings at the moment, but people can still find you at smithmadronewinery.com or we, is it? We will, yes, smithmadrone.com, smithmadrone.com. Okay. And we are still selling wine. We like selling wine. Uh, it's, it's what keeps um, us going. Uh, so, but we're, we're thinking about, we can't imagine that this, you know, Gavin Newsom has said California's opening on June 15th and, and we're going to hold it, hold him to it. Okay. Good. Good. And yeah. so in the meantime, the 16, which Debbie and I had were, is actually only available now in that, in that vertical, but the 17 is is there the current release and there's also the 16 magnums and the 16, 16 magnums. magnums definitely got whoever's listening to this get the 16 magnum you will that is not just, be disappointed yeah. that's just it's, it's really a fun party. Model. that's just yeah. going to be a party <laughs> yeah. Yeah. excellent summer's coming i can see it by the pool yeah yeah excellent. on the boat and and, and again the, ding the dinghy dock the dinghy dock. <laughs> Lori's been on our boat. It's, it's I have like been. Dinghy dock. I have been. He's been to the marina. D is for dinghy. Yeah. I like it. I like yeah. it. So uh, I just want to say thank you so much, Stu, for taking time out to talk to us and share your knowledge on Riesling and to share your stories. And um, I honestly can't wait for you to open again because I want to come visit. and. Me too. Uh, Go, go through go through tasting with you um, in real life. It will be nice to do that. But again, it's smithmadrone.com. And I, I mean, I think it's a rare moment. I will always promote wines, whatever, but this is a wine I personally love, like vintage after vintage. Yes. I love it. And I know this is Riesling, but your cab is, is beautiful. Uh, it's just your wines are, I, I don't want to steal Debbie's word, but it's perfect. Debbie called it elegant. and It's elegant in a bottle. I mean, you you drink any of Stu's wines and it's just like dancing on your palate and the stars are rising like this and it's just elegant. It's completely balanced. It's just wonderful. I mean, it's, and, I can't describe I, it anymore. Yeah, I mean. I, and I have to say, uh, I, of, I, I wish I could clone you. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say that I was laughing at you pushing the food off or whatever, because honestly, Stu, with your wines, I, I, I just want to drink the wines by themselves. Like they are so they, they pair wonderfully with, with food, but they don't need, they, they're just great on their own. And it's almost like, I don't want to share my palate with the food. <laughs> Thank you for that. You know, <laughs> I, I, let me just say one thing uh, to anyone that's listening, and that is that um, what I try to say to people um, who are just getting in, into wine is to enjoy what you do, but most importantly, um, uh, taste with your mouth, not your eyes. Don't let the label influence you. And wine is to be fun first and foremost. It's to give you pleasure. And if and if for some reason the wine that you're not drinking isn't pleasurable, move on to something else. There's lots of other yeah. wines out there. Um, and and I, you know it, it's it's it, and don't be intimidated by other people. Wine should be fun. It should be pleasurable. You want to share it with friends, and trust your own palate. You, you, and just because you may not like the wine, it doesn't mean that it's a bad wine. It just means you don't like it. And that's okay. Um, that's what I tell people all the time. 
Yeah. And, and well, somehow okay your spouse doesn't like it and you like it because you like it. Exactly. And so, I've loved I it. Have, you guys are great. Thank you. you I have a little too, left. Stu, and I can't wait to come and meet and drink wine with you. And I can't wait for you guys to come and visit too. Okay. So, so cheers. Cheers. Slancha. Slancha. Bye-bye.